What about, uh, we talked about uh, four drug combinations were mentioned and there were a number of abstracts here at the meeting in which four drugs were being employed. Um, did anything particularly stand out for you? Well, you know, there's um, uh, Shaji Kumar presented an abstract with introduction now, daratumumab plus um, um, uh, the triplet PIA mid uh, dexamethasone combination. I don't think we're ready. There were a number of other trials, so I'm not going to drill down into the details. I think the logic is there. You know, I used to say that uh, uh, clinical trials for myeloma were like, you know, racers for shaving. You know, if two blades was good, maybe three is better and four is going to be even better. But the reality is that the new benchmark is MRD negativity. Uh, uh, MRD, and we're going to talk more about that later, but getting a deep response is so important that any agent that uh, contributes to that process, I think, is going to be part of the optimal induction therapy. So, so what I'm seeing just is the, sort of the opening, you know, the, 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 the first foray at this four drug combinations, but um, we would have to see, just like what we're saying with E1A11, which is KRD versus VRD, we'll have to see that for four drugs as well. So, so you mentioned Dr. Kumar's abstract. He presented on the use of exasm of an oral proteasome inhibitor with lenalidomide and uh, daratumumab. Dexmeth, so what did you think of that, Faith? So I can say I think there's been quite a lot of data that's being presented about including daratumumab in our upfront regimens. And um, it certainly seems to be effective. Um, it seems to induce good MRD negativity and it seems to be very safe. So I think it's a drug that's going to stay. And I think, as you were saying, we're going to be in, I guess, a luxurious position of deciding which drug combination is going to be best fit for our, our patients, whether we go an all oral route, whether we have an intravenous combination, and then, you know, what are their other I was quite impressed with the IRD data data. It was actually better than I thought it would be. And it is a very convenient regimen. I mean, it's basically three oral drugs plus a what eventually becomes a monthly infusion. Did anybody else feel similarly enamored with that or do you think this is only for older people? No, I don't know that it's for older people, but I would like to have a better way of distinguishing which patients need that for drug therapy. I still have plenty of patients who may even get Cyborg D and get a CR within a couple of cycles. You know, we may not need to do four drugs for everybody, but we don't yet have a good test to decide which ones would or would not. I do think it's a wonderful challenge to have that we can pick and choose and find the right triplet for that patient. So it may be age, it may be comorbidity. One of the regimens we've, we've all used a lot the last decade is, is Cyborg D, which is cyclophosphamide based. But there was a presentation on cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and daratumumab with dexamethasone, another four drug. And I actually got the impression that that was a little bit less effective when we looked at depth of response? Um, so I, I, I thought the four drug regimens, I do think that ASH 2018 will change the way we practice in terms of induction therapy for um, myeloma, no doubt about it. Um, so there's two ones, that's the Lyra study that you talked about, VCD plus daratumumab, it was a phase two study. It was done actually by um, a co-op, yeah, community group. And the reason I think mostly was it seemed less impressive is the way they assessed responses. They assessed it by a computer program, a computer program that actually has to look at the bone marrow biopsy and decipher the bone marrow biopsy result and decide whether it's CR or stringent CR, et cetera. So those data are gonna improve as the computer program gets better and the docs are better. I just wondered if it was partly just real life. Uh, real, these aren't clinical trial I, patients, they're real life patients. I don't think so, I think that's part of it. But the other study that was presented was the Griffin study. And that's a re, it's a large study in, in the US where it's RVD plus daratumumab. It was actually, it's a randomized phase two tri trial. The, the patients that they presented were the first 16 patients, the run-in, to just see that, make sure that RVD Dara was safe and effective. And in those 16 patients, the CR, stringent CR rate was, was over 60%. It was very impressive. Yeah, it was, it was only a small number of patients, it just was to be small. very clear. But yes. that trial has accrued over 200 patients now. So I think next Correct. year, I, I was actually very impressed with the RVD Dara mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. Did, Adriana, your thoughts on that? Is that going to be our standard of care or is it? Well, again, I think it probably will, but it would be nice to know in whom we actually need the fourth drug and which well, three drug combinations. You, I don't think everybody needs to be treated the same. I think the new... Why would you, know, you not add a fourth drug if its response rates are higher and depth of response is better? What would stop you? Well, one of the things being the financial toxicity of trying to get 
four of these drugs for everybody, you know, and as our patients are living longer and we ascribe to continuous therapy, also how long are you going to go with four? And when you peel back, which ones do you, you peel back? You grow up the dreaded, let's stay away from those a little bit. Um, it, toxicity though, adding a fourth drug, I was impressed, either of you, that, that uh, there was quite a lot of infection when one added daratumumab. In that RVD dara trial, there was 25% uh, fairly significant infections, pneumonia. Well, you, you know, I mean, Dara, we're, everyone likes Dara. We're putting it in combinations, but it, one has to remember the hypogamma and other effects on the immune system we have yet to understand. And um, oftentimes we've seen this in patients, of course, who are, who are heavily pretreated, so I don't think the signal has been as clear, but now we have to be, you know, careful about that. Now, the one interesting thing is, is we think about infection prophylaxis now for myeloma frontline. You know, there's a study with, uh, you know, levofloxacin a year ago. Should they be on, you know, the, the trimethoprim for, for, you know, should they be on fluconazole? They all need to be on acyclovir. So they're going to take as many pills now as for prevention as they're taking for primary therapy. But it is a challenge that we need to be mindful about. Faith, your experience with, if you, you found early infection to be a problem with? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, as you mentioned, the pneumonia is, is the one. It's, um, and we, so we really, really need to be um, observant for that. And uh, I think that, as you say, we, we need to do prophylaxis. Um, but I think it's, it's that we prophylax in other, other disease areas without batting an eyelid. So why shouldn't so we do it? So it's pneumovax, flu, it's what about Levaquin? Has everybody started using Levaquin again? With induction therapy, I definitely use Levaquin. And I will say on the infection risk, there's two time periods that we have to worry about. It's induction therapy and then maintenance-based therapy. And most of the infection is during induction, and that's why I do use Levoquin during that period of time, and uh, Bactrim or Scepter for, for PCP prophylaxis. What I think we really need to look at as we use daratumumab as maintenance-based therapy, are we going to see late pneumonias and late complications? That is going to really, in my mind, be the key.